Okay, we're back from the break. Henry Grajone, investigative reporter here out of New York City with a great panel, uh, as we were discussing before. And we're talking about uh, Reba Sherrill, who's running for the 21st Congressional District uh, this Tuesday, the 18th. And we all wish her luck. And also we're discussing uh, the nursing home crisis that's happening. And uh, at this point, uh, we'll take it from there. Edwin, if you would like to uh, take it from here while I'm trying to deal with some uh, difficulties. Wait. Great. Right. Well, uh, you know, dur during the break, um, uh, Rick and Dr. Annette uh, had some great, uh, had a great discussion about what they see are seeing in the senior care uh, and the uh, uh, assisted living facility. Uh, in fact, um, I believe Rick has been working with uh, a group in Nevada uh, with people that uh, Dr. Annette has um, has been working with. Um, uh, Rick, can you uh, can you talk about some of the things that that you have been doing, uh, not only in the state of North Carolina but uh, nationwide, uh, like in states like Nevada? Yeah, sure. My wife and I founded a five hundred one c three nonprofit called SEER, the Center for State Administration Reform, and we advocate for victims of predatory attorneys. That's that's the primary goal. Uh, guardianship is a big part of that. We got into this when, <laughs> I got a little background noise here, I apologize for that. Um, we got into this when her, da her, her dad was taken captive in Las Vegas in 2013. And we've spent the last now seven years uh, working with a number of groups, but, but building a network nationwide to expose these atrocities and try to get law enforcement engaged to actually view these as criminal acts, extortion, embezzlement, exploitation, theft from vulnerable adults. Uh, the discussion that Dr. Tierro and I were having was on us cutting our teeth on this issue in Nevada back in 2013. Um, and what we've been able to accomplish, which we're trying to translate those successes to other states, which, which has been rather difficult. You know, there's about 1.5 million adults under guardianship in the U.S., and the legal community has come to view guardianship and other frauds, but certainly guardianship as entitlement. And they have no reason or desire to see any slowdown or impediment in the ability to grow their business through guardianships, many of which are what we term fraudulent. Hope that's, I hope that helps what you're looking for. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Annette, uh, you uh, have worked with some of the uh, uh, people that uh, Rick has been working with in Nevada, right? That's right. So um, on my end, not having met Rick before, I know that we had some issues throughout the legislative sessions the last, um, since he was talking about early 2000s, where we've tried to close some of the loops. And these are very important, just so that our audience understands the population in the entire United States, the, from 2010 to 2030, the number of seniors will double. So we'll go from 40 million to 80 million. That's a lot of people that then will become um, wards of the state or wards in a trust as they age because they have limitations, either cognitive limitations or physical limitations. And so therefore they need somebody to assist them. So the problem has been on the rise and will continue to rise as the baby boomers continue throughout um, their retirement time. Uh, so we addressed some of the issues in one of the legislative sessions that made it so that if someone was a guardian that the person had chosen, but they were out of state, there was an ability <coughs> for someone to kind of nullify that and have a guardian that was in state. And there was kind of like this inner working uh, mechanism where these supposed public administrating guardians were then funneling money out of the poor uh, ward uh, accounts and doing things, selling off um, uh, properties or uh, doing things that were not in the best interest of the patients. Uh, again, this can happen to someone who's even in a long-term care facility. And this can be devastating because long-term care facilities are costly 
And if someone is mismanaging your funds, then therefore, not only do we have to worry about health issues, but we have to worry about financial issues too. Yeah. Give me a second. Um, so we're back. We have Reba Cheryl who's back. I'm going to allow her to introduce the new guest that came on. Uh, again, uh, my name is Henry Grajone, an investigative reporter out of New York, accompanied by my co-host. Uh, we call ourselves Team Live. We represent Coast to Coast. Uh, Edwin Duterte, who was a former um, uh, uh, candidate for congressional, the 43rd Congressional against Maxine Waters back in 2018. Dr. Annette Tejero, who is a doctor out of Nevada, and she also ran in the past, a couple of times I believe it is, for congressional seats. And Reba Cheryl, who is running for the 21st Congressional District this coming Tuesday, and we wish her all the luck. Uh, Reba, would you like to introduce your guest so he can speak and he can uh, give a little introduction who he is and where he's from? Before I introduce Sean, I want to take issue with something that Annette just said, and I find it really offensive because she has the assumption that all these elders will need to be a ward of the state and that they will need a guardian and um, that the majority of these people, and we're gonna have all these people influxing in and that they're going to need someone to handle their affairs. I want to take the stance that we can have expectation that these people will live out their lives and they will be fully capable and competent to take care of their needs because we're going to change the healthcare industry so that they will have wellness into the latter years. Because I, I want to tell you something. This is why I'm so passionate about this topic right here. Because people make the assumption that you can't handle your own affairs because you have a major injury, which is what happened to me, or you get old. And we don't need to have that kind of attitude. We need to foster positivity. We need to foster the fact that people can take care of themselves. And if they need a helping hand, helping clean their house or something, that's fine. But you don't need a ward of the state. You don't have to be a ward of the state if you need little bits of things like that. So I, tie, I take high offense to what you said. Now I'm going to um, introduce Sean McBride. He's an attorney here in Florida. And, uh, and he also has offices in Texas. Um, and I'll let him further explain that, but he is active here. We're working together to uh, combat these mandatory vaccines and mandatory masks that have been put upon us here in Florida. Sean, please take it away. Hey everyone, thanks. Uh, good to meet you all. I'm a corporate attorney by training. I've been uh, I've been active in freedom issues now for for several years, but really turned up the wick with these forced vaccine laws. And a, a lot of people may not be aware of everything that's going on. I'll kind of give you a quick lay of the land, and we can dive in depending on what everybody wants to talk about. But um, a number of states in the U.S. already have mandatory vaccination laws, and that would include Florida, Georgia, Virginia, Maryland, Massachusetts, Arizona, New Mexico. So uh, a lot of states have already jumped in. They've already given statutory authority, usually to the governor or to a state health officer, to determine whether the people in the state need to be vaccinated. Uh, Florida gives all the power to one person who's the state health officer. They decide if people need to be isolated or quarantined. That state health officer then decides if the isolation and quarantine is not practical. And if they decide it's not practical, then they can use any means necessary, which is what the law says, to force vaccinate people. Uh, Florida goes a step farther than most and actually says they can use law enforcement uh, to force the vaccines. Uh, Pennsylvania and Montana don't have statutes on the books, but either their judges or their governors have come up with reasons how the state could potentially force vaccinate people um, with a COVID vaccine. Um, regardless of the fact that they don't have a law on the books using either constitutional arguments or uh, territorial arguments. Montana goes back to the time they were territory prior to being a state and they say because they could force vaccinate people as a territory, they could also force vaccinate people as a state. So um, New England Journal of Medicine put out an article in late June telling states they should start studying the possibility of forced vaccinating people. Uh, so there's a lot of activity going around this. There's starting to be a lot of talk. A group of doctors came out a week ago in USA Today and said everybody should be uh, required to take a COVID vaccine. And then when you do, you'll be given an ID card, which has an expiration date on it. Then you can use that card to ride a bus, get on a plane, go into a grocery store, whatever. So there's a lot of, lot of activity right now around a forced vaccine. And of course, one of the concerns I have is there's so much talk about forcing everybody to take the vaccine right now. And we know that this is a rush trial for, for important reasons, right? They're trying to get a vaccine out to people. They're speeding up the testing process. 
but it's a new generation of vaccine, hasn't been fully tested yet. Everybody's, there's a whole body of people that are talking about forcing people to take the vaccine when we haven't even seen the final vaccine yet and hasn't even been approved. Uh, so we're trying to spread awareness to people that these laws are on the books uh, and kind of open the discussion so that people can talk to their elected representatives about what they think is the appropriate channel for these things. So I know I dumped a lot of you on you guys quickly. I came no, it's okay. Call, it was yeah. another call. So bring me, uh, bring you up the speed so we can get coordinated. But that's kind of where I'm at in this world right now. That's okay. No, thank you. There's a couple of issues now. And of course, we're talking about the nursing home uh, crisis. But I wanted to give an opportunity to Dr. Annette Tejero um, in response uh, earlier. Ms. Rebus, I know you had a very passionate uh, way. Um, Ms. Tejero, you want to take it away, Dr. Tejero? And, speak on or maybe uh, on a rebuttal possibly so we can have a lively discussion? Well, my, my point was a demographic point. I never implied that people that were elderly or disabled always needed a guardian. I just said that people were taking advantage of the situation that, that as the population grew, therefore the opportunity for these predatory people grew. And that's what we needed to address. And every state needs to address this because as that portion of our population grows, we don't want the opportunity to be there for these people to be um, abused and mis, uh, their, their finances being mismanaged. So I think Reba probably misunderstood that I think that everybody that's elderly should be in guardianship. Um, I have an 89 year old mother. She does not need a guardianship. She lives by herself. She's very independent. I have uh, a mother-in-law who's now 96, soon to be 97 years old. And she lives in her original home. And yes, she has family with her, but you know, she's pretty much determined what it is that she's going to do. We just went through her um, potential of a will and uh, counseling her on perhaps getting a trust so that she gets everything together. So I think that people do need to be autonomous, but we also need to be aware that as people get older, they also become more vulnerable to a broken system. Okay, uh, Reba, would you like to, as we go into the nursing home crisis itself, we had two hearings here in New York. Uh, the second one was wishy-washy, I call it, because you have the Democrats that are leading uh, the New York Assembly and New York State Senate, and they had the New York State Department of Health uh, Commissioner. He was on the first hearing, which was uh, 8-3 in 2020. And again, there's a lot of information or misinformation we have 6600 on deaths in counting mm -hmm. and uh in florida i believe you guys are hovering around 2500 you could correct me if i'm wrong reba and you guys are considered now the epicenter what is your take on this being the epicenter now with 550,901 confirmed covid cases what's your take on that uh at this point well, we've already uncovered a lot of uh, uh, misinformation that's been put out to the public. The reporting has been faulty by a measure of anywhere from 10 to 13 times. So the numbers are incorrect. We have people that were shot in the head with a gun or people run over by a car and they're reporting these as COVID deaths. This kind of stuff just should not be happening. We've uncovered a lot of these cases. And the people that are testing positive, they moved the decimal point and they reported that 98% were positive when it was really only 9.8%. And so uh, there's a lot of uh, hanky panky going on with the numbers in Florida. I think everything that they have been basing these uh, mandates on and these rules have been based on uh, misinformation and it's been a deliberate concerted effort by people in government who mean to take advantage of the people and manipulate the election. That's what I think. That's okay. what I know. That's what we before have I, of. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I turn it over back to you, Edwin, I have a quick question for Mr. McBride. You are a corporate attorney by trade, you mentioned, yes. right? Yes. Okay, here in New York, part of the hearings uh, and the state senators were really coming down on uh, Governor Cuomo was mm -hmm. a blanket immunity that he added on in our budget on April 1st, I believe, or April 2nd. That's the hottest number right now. They're saying that they even passed a bill, a joint bill between Assembly and Senate, saying that this blanket immunity, uh, it cannot happen. And there's a bill that I think it's really, again, wishy-washy. I think it was something just to uh, make everybody think that uh, it's over with. What is your take on a blanket immunity for these nursing homes? And that's the hottest number here in New York that we're going through. 
Yeah, and I'd, I'd, I'd have to look at it state by state, but a lot of states have, you know, balanced budget provisions where they have to know how much they're spending. And there's a real issue with an immunity um, for a couple of reasons. And I, I don't know the specifics of the immunity you're talking about. So some of these immunities coming down right now, like the COVID vaccine, the government's actually picking up the liability. So to the extent the government's picking up the liability, you got one issue right there, right? So if you're offering people immunity and saying, hey, the government will make you whole, which is what the federal government's doing with some of the vaccine manufacturers, uh, how, do you, how do you know how much liability you're taking, particularly when you have companies like AstraZeneca coming out and saying that we have to transfer the liability to the government because we don't know what the side effects are going to be. Um, so that's, that's the first issue. Uh, giving immunity to the nursing homes for these COVID deaths, I mean, you have a couple of issues there. Uh, obviously, one thing is, you know, you can't change, you can't, you can't have a taking, right? You can't take somebody's property. So to the extent somebody's already died, you can't change the law retroactively per se, right? So if you're trying to give immunity for people that have already died because of COVID, I can see a real constitutional challenge for that because that family has that right to the claim or whatever losses or expenses were tied to the death, right? So, um, you can't, so that would be a problem. As far as an immunity going forward, uh, we certainly have had a federal immunity under the 1986 Act with the vaccine. So there is some precedent to offering people immunity around healthcare things. But, um, you know, that those have been, those, I mean, that's been settled. The U.S. Supreme Court has held that up. So the potential is there to do it going forward. I would think you could potentially do uh, some level of immunity, but you have to obviously make sure that you're not taking people's rights and you know whatever whatever that whatever that would be and i'd have to get deeper into it to do a good analysis of it oh thank you thank you edwin uh i i, I hey I'd, uh, I'd just like to make a comment oh, sure. on that guys and i'm i'm sure that reba supports it offering long-term care facilities immunity is absolutely inappropriate the, the immunity that we are talking about is there are gaps in the oversight of our long-term care system nationwide. And in fact, many states, as Sean pointed out, many states, it's so actively integrated, the long-term care facilities with the State Department of Social Services or whatever name it comes under, that they are protected for the somewhat shoddy or poor care that the lowest common denominator is often protected by the state infrastructure and that's been growing for decades medicare medicaid fraud being two that i would highlight and medicaid fraud which we focus on is 140 billion dollars a year in the u.s and growing now we bring the pandemic you know if there's one silver lining with the pandemic it's, it has shown a spotlight on the issues in long-term care, which we are hopeful, those of us who are activists and advocates for vulnerable adults, that it shines a spotlight that gets the corrections in place and reforms that should have been initiated decades ago. Immunity takes all that away and makes it even worse that now those second-tier long-term care, third-tier long-term care are saying, wow, this is great. Now I can even be more abusive and my state is gonna protect me with immunity. And that's why we are very much against what Governor Cuomo did and what other states are considering because all it will do is open up Pandora's box for the exploitation to grow. Okay, okay. Great. Edwin? And uh, you know, Reba, uh, Reba uh, on, on a federal level, on a legislative side, what can be done to uh, to be an advocate for not only the patient uh, but also the, the care uh, care home facilities uh, operators? Uh, what what can we what what can you what will you propose uh, to have a win win and uh, be you know fiscally uh, responsible as well as uh, be a strong advocate for the patients? Well, I'm going to tell you something. For many decades now. Legislation has been written across the board uh, on the federal level and the state level that have been in favor of corporations. And we need to reverse course because we are a government of the people, for the people, by the people. We need to have laws that are written on the books that are protecting the rights of the individual person in our country, not for corporations. And so we need to be ever vigilant to protect our rights 
and uh, not be taken advantage of by these nursing homes, hospitals, or what have you, um, these corporations should not be given this, this immunity. No way. We need to have the ability to have recourse when we are wronged. And uh, so the laws need to be written for our protection, not for corporate protection. Understood. And, and uh, with, the, with these, uh, especially with the senior living, uh, a lot of the assisted living uh, are done by, are, are operated by mom and pop, uh, small businesses and so forth. How could we, uh, you know, on the legislative side, protect uh, the, uh, the operations of small, small businesses, as well as protect uh, the, the rights of, 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 of the patients? Well, you know, I think that one of the things we need to look at for our elders and people that have disabilities who require someone to help them, because I'm disabled. You know, I'm technically disabled. I'm a paraplegic, I'm in a wheelchair, but I don't need anyone to make my decisions or to take care of me, even though some people think that that would be the case. I live alone, I take care of my own needs, I do my shopping, my cooking, my laundry, I clean my house. Like I don't need somebody to be my caregiver. And I'm very offended by people who uh, have that kind of attitude that it would even be warranted because people uh, have different capabilities. I was never unable to make my own decisions. It's just uh, in my case, um, I had a university medical center that decided they wanted my money. And so they attacked me with an abusive guardianship situation and uh, I got that overturned. But, um, you know, we, we need to have a system set up to protect the people. Much in the same way, um, over 30 years ago, I helped to set up an organization of volunteers who would be trained, and they would be advocates for children in foster care. And we called it CASA, Court Appointed Special Advocates. And uh, the adults uh, trained volunteer would go through the system with these children um, and they would monitor and they would make sure that nothing was being done inappropriately and they would be an advocate for that child with the court system. So uh, in the same way, I would like to see something set up to protect the elders that do need an extra uh, pair of eyes to make sure that abuses are not taking place. Uh, just because someone goes to live in an assisted living or a nursing home doesn't mean that they're incompetent and can't make their own decisions. I, I think we need to make sure that um, the individuals who are capable of doing those things needs to be allowed and encouraged to continue to do those things for themselves because we don't want to push them into an early grave because they give up hope and, and they feel like they have no value. We need to change the attitude towards our elders in this country. We need to show them due respect just as we need to do for our veterans. When they come back from fighting these wars, from serving overseas or even serving in our homeland, you know, a lot of times they are not given the respect that they are due. And uh, we, we need to reinstitute that. That is a primary character trait in individuals that I have seen over the last 30 plus years is sorely lacking is respect. Okay, uh, before we go, I want to go to Dr. Ned Edwin, if you don't mind. Um, and my question is, um, my grandmother's 98 years old, and I am an advocate for the seniors, but also because my grandmother's a survivor of coronavirus. I've been through a lot of issues. I'm still going through issues. Dr. Ned, um, for a person like myself being a family member, uh, what hope can you give me if there is a second wave as a doctor? What, what can you tell me? Uh, how can we handle, because you see how the nursing homes between New York and four other states, how horribly they handled it. Can you give me any hope that we're able to fight this on a second wave? Well, first of all, for you personally, Henry, your grandmother's already had COVID-19 and she survived. Chances are that she will maintain her antibodies in her system and she has survived it once and the second wave won't be an issue for her. It's sort of like people that have been around since the Spanish flu and therefore H1N1 um, didn't seem to affect them as much as the general population that had not seen that. So that's a good point for you. Um, we were talking a little bit about these long-term care facilities. I think people had the mentality when they structured these 
Um, you have to understand that a lot of the elderly and disabled population, they do have financial resources. And how they set these things up is they actually set them up more like a warehouse rather than a compassionate living arrangement. And I think that Reba would agree with me that these people are human beings. They must have autonomy. Um, yes, they may need some special things, but we should never, ever, ever treat them as warehoused adults that you just stick in a corner and forget about them. Um, a lot of these facilities charge an inordinate amount of money, but in exchange, they're not really very cautious. Like for instance, when you go to a hospital and you're in isolation, I think Henry and I have spoken about this in detail as to my concerns as a physician when I went to visit people in long-term care facilities was that it really wasn't set up as safely as uh, families were led to believe. You know, staff goes in and out. A lot of the staff is not highly paid staff. Um, obviously some corners are cut. And therefore, when COVID-19 arrived, for the first time we have had a, uh, an opportunity to look inside of these nursing homes without actually being there and seeing that they're not set up for isolation. They're not set up to optimize visitation by family members and not risk other people. And this, frankly, should have been something that should have been done by our government overseeing. You know, we're, we're taught that, oh, we have to have an agency for this, an agency for that. But what you find is that the agencies become complacent and are unaccountable. And my push to you, Reba, is in your congressional um, capacity is to make people accountable for what it is that they're supposedly supervising. Because if we have accountability, we cannot sit back as we the people and just kind of like let things go. Because agencies notoriously will get lazy, they will get complacent, and it is not their loved one. It's a very callous thing to allow government into the personal decisions which is what my major gripe was when I actually read Obamacare and realized, oh my goodness, we are in trouble. And you know what? We're seeing it right now with COVID-19. This is precisely why I ran, because I saw the potential for the abuses. You think there are potentials for abuses for elderly, there are potentials for abuses for the disabled, there are potentials for abuses on everybody. Dr. Ned, let me turn it back to, to Edwin. Edwin, you wanna, because we're coming to the end. Uh, so you could give a closing, but we want to give Ms. Reba a last opportunity uh, as her last pitch, because she is the candidate. You want to do that? You want to take over, Edwin, and uh, take it from there? Uh, your mute button, Edwin. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, Reba, you know, congratulations again on, on your run for Congress. We wish you all the best. If someone wanted to get in touch with you to help you, to assist you uh, monetarily, or if they would want to knock on doors or make calls on your behalf, how would they get in touch with you? Well, they can go to my website, rebaforcongress.com, and there's a place where you can uh, send me an email, uh, or you can go to the volunteer page and you can uh, indicate what you would be willing to help out with. And again, that's R-E-B-A-F-O-R congress.com. Um, and I just want to say that I, I take this position of, of representing the people of District 21 extremely seriously. Um, you know, I'm a voice for the voiceless and I'm the real deal. Uh, I'm, I'm not a politician. And I'm not going to be intimidated. I'm lobbyists, no, they can just go away. I'm not interested in your money. I don't care. I can't be bought. I'm here to fight for you and for your needs and your rights. And I won't stop fighting even after the election. You know, if if by some, um, you know, some fluke that I, I didn't get elected on, on the primary, I'm going to continue fighting. And I will go to D.C. in some capacity. I will continue this fight. I'm not going to, to relinquish this fight. I know I'm the strongest voice for the people in District 21 and across the nation. Um, I will root out this fraud and corruption. It's something I'm uh, deliberately pursuing and will uh, not stop until it's accomplished. 
Okay. And, well, and since, you, since this is the last week for the primary, uh, any events uh, that our, our audience needs to be aware of? Are you knocking on doors and uh, do you need uh, assistance uh, with, with any of that? I tell you, um, I've issued a three-day call to prayer and fasting from Friday evening until Monday evening. We have this example given in uh, Jonah uh, in the scripture where the city of Nineveh, uh, they were due to be destroyed. And God had Jonah go and uh, preach to the people in the streets. And they were commanded by their leader to fast and pray for three days even the animals and they did so and they received mercy and this year is so critical and if we don't stand up against this tyranny against this corruption this fraud that has been perpetrated on we the people we're going to lose everything and that's just not an option we are the best hope of this planet and we need to stand up for all humanity well, said. well we, we wanted to thank real quickly, Mr. Bry, thank you so much for your insight and being with us here. It was an honor. Mr. Scott, uh, North Carolina, have fun out there. I hope you enjoy yourself. We pray to God because we are God-fearing folks here. We're not ashamed to say it that this coronavirus, we don't want this to, to, to be the end of us. We're just beginning to fight. Right, Edwin? You got it. Thanks, Henry. Thanks, Edwin. Dr. Tejero, Marie Bashiro, thank you so much. And until the next time, Ms. Reba, God be with you on Tuesday, okay? Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Good luck. All right. Thank you, guys.